Okay, welcome to almost the end. It certainly uh, will be the end of the plant unit, more or less. Uh, we have just a couple other things to do uh, before we are done. Uh, we are tackling in this unit, uh, in this podcast, uh, transport, movement of materials in a plant. Um, please remember, we're talking about... Um, uh, the more advanced plants, the angiosperms, big plants. Uh, while a flower may not seem big, it certainly is big compared to a tiny little moss. And they can get big because they have uh, uh, vascular tissue that allows them to have like plumbing to move just simply vast amounts of water uh, up the plant uh, from the soil up and vast amounts of sugar down the plant, much more than can be accounted for by osmosis or diffusion by itself. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about because we are talking about the movement of water and sugar, two different things. We are going to talk about this in two different hunks. We are going to talk about the movement of water first, which is called transpiration, and we will uh, attack that right now. Um, do please remember that when we are talking about moving materials, while we are pulling into play some big pipes, we do have to realize that everything does ultimately still rely on the perme permeability of cell membranes. So this is a kind of a nice going back and remembering that cell membranes are at the very foundation of how living things move materials from one place to another. Please don't forget the uh, ideas of osmosis and diffusion. They will be foundational in this, though we're going to kind of ramp it up quite a bit. Um, transport proteins that will allow specific materials um, to to go into or out of a cell. Um, remember facilitated diffusion, active transport that actually requires energy from the cell, whereas none of these things requires energy from the cell for it to occur. Uh, Co-transport we talked about briefly when we talked about cell membranes. Proton pumps, we've seen these before in um, in cell respiration, particularly as part of the electron transport chain, the uh, ETC. Uh, yes, chemiosmosis, if you'll remember that term. Um, all of this can play a role uh, to a greater or lesser extent in moving things around in a plant, just like it did in an animal. Okay. I also want to remind you of this term, aquaporin is the name of the channel that actually um, facilitates the diffusion of water. Um, uh, there we see water molecules, little red and white structures moving through this glob of protein. Uh, this channel is specifically designed to allow water to pass through it. Um, so anywhere we see osmosis happening, most of it is happening because aquaporin molecules are present inside the cell membranes and allow the water molecules to pass across cell membranes. Now, uh, foundational as well um, to movement of water in plants is um, an, an idea, having an idea about water potential. This is really just another way of talking about water concentrations. Remember in osmosis water moves from an area of high concentration where there's a lot of water molecules to an area of low concentration where there's not as many. That's osmosis. Water potential is just another way of saying that water moves from an area of high potential to an area of lower potential, a okay, place so where there's lots of water to a place where there is less water, okay? High to low. Um, water potential, how, how much water there is in a place is, and how likely it is to move is determined by two things. What we have mostly focused on is solute concentration, in other words, if I have water and a membrane, here's a bag of water, and I've got a membrane running through the bag, and I have water, H2O molecules here and here, and I dump a bunch of salt 
on the side, I would dump a bunch of salt in. My pure water concentration is higher on this side, and the water molecules will tend to move over there because the pure water is lower because I dumped all the salt in. So don't forget about how solute, which would be the salt in this case, concentration can affect uh, movement of water. But also don't forget that pressure can affect movement of water. If I have a water balloon and I squeeze on it, I'm going to be pushing that water in another direction. In plant cells, that's important because plant cells are like water balloons and they get full of water, they get turgid, they get happy, uh, but uh, we have to remember that less pressure might or more pressure can push water in one direction or another. Okay, so pressure and solute concentration can affect how water moves. Okay, so more solute like over here means we will have a lower water potential. More pressure, though, squeezing on the cell, for example, would cause a higher water potential. Yeah, please make sure you know this. Water potential and concentrations of water are essentially, you can use those in the same way. All right, now, foundational as well to movement of material in plants is that there are two types of pressure we will see at play. There is positive pressure like squeezing on the water balloon and psh, the water comes out, okay, um, and negative pressure. Positive pressure, I already mentioned, negative pressure, I want you to pick, picture a syringe like uh, a needle like you might get a shot with. If you put the syringe in the fluid and pull up on the plunger, the syringe fills with fluid. That is due not to positive pressure, because positive pressure is going to make the liquid shoot out of the syringe. Negative pressure is a kind of pulling pressure where the fluid would actually come up into the syringe. So you need to think of this as kind of a pulling pressure, whereas this is more of a pushing pressure, okay? So negative and positive pressure. Negative pressure is also called tension, okay? And this is the one negative pressure that we are going to be following in transpiration or the movement of water through the plant, okay? I do want you to remember these terms turgor pressure and plasmolysis mainly because this is just a good place to remember that these terms existed. Remember these words hypotonic and hypertonic and turgid and flaccid. If you don't remember those, you, let's review them uh, at a review session, okay? Um, Plasmolysis uh, is when a cell loses water and the cell membrane, if this is my plant cell, there's my cell wall, here is my cell membrane, and right now the cell is turgid. The cell membrane is full of H2O and it's like a full water balloon. But remember plasmolysis is when water leaves the cell and the poor little old cell membrane just collapses and because the water has left uh, due to osmosis. And um, so let's try to remember those words. If, if you don't, please let's try. Uh, we'll catch it in a review session. All right, last term before we get into more specifics, bulk flow. This is when we are moving massive quantities of material in an organism. You do bulk flow in your own body. Your heart is pushing massive volumes of blood and blood plasma, water, or whatever, throughout your body uh, in large amounts, uh, rapidly. Um, Plants do bulk flow as well. They do so using their own vascular tissue, xylem and phloem. So xylem and phloem are how or the means by which bulk flow occurs, a massive movement of material. Okay, So two major types of bulk flow, one using phloem, one using xylem. This one is dealing with the movement of massive amounts of food. This one's dealing with the movement of massive amounts of water. This is the one we will talk about first. Now, understand that moving water by in bulk in huge amounts does begin with bringing in tiny bits of water a little at a time by essentially osmosis. Okay. So, of course, we know that water from the soil 
is going into the root of the plant. Okay. Um, now remember we have root hairs out here. This is a cross section of a plant root, so this is the ep epidermis. We're seeing a root hair and water. This is creating more surface area so water can come in. Okay. Um, now if water does come into this plant and we, it can follow one of two paths. It can come in and actually because cellulose in the cell walls is very very porous it can flow f through the cell walls between cell walls and the water is seeking or seeking to get to the center of the plant to go into the vascular tissue that's where the, the xylem is going to be in the center of the plant root but water can take another path as well it can be absorbed and enter into the actual cells and be passed from one cell to the next to the next to the next to the next and enter the uh, center of the plant this is important because it is far preferable at some point for water and any solutes it contains to actually pass through actual cells because it is only if it passes through an actual cell membrane that it will be checked and certain maybe toxins or whatever bad chemicals will not be allowed to enter into the vascular tissue and be transported to the plant. So what is necessary then is a way to divert any water that is just flowing through here let me do something really quick any water that is passing through what is called the apoplastic root the cell wall root and not actually entering a cell it's just flowing along porous cell walls we want to force that eventually to pass through a cell so it can be checked okay now, um, this is just showing the flow. Okay, so we want it to be checked. The way the plants have achieved this is there is a ring of cells that surrounds the vascular tissue. The vascular tissue is called the steel. It's the xylem and the phloem, though we're only emphasizing xylem here. Um, but the steel is this patch of vascular tissue in the center of the root. There is a ring called the endodermis. But what's important about the endodermis that surrounds the vascular tissue is that it has waxy strips that go across cell walls here um, all the way around. These waxy strips are called the Casparian strips after the dude that discovered them. And what they do when water reaches, if it's flowing along and bumps into the Casparian strip, the Casparian strip is made of wax water can't penetrate wax. Remember, lipids and water don't mix. So that forces the water to go into a cell and be checked. And if there's harmful substances, the cell will stop them from passing further into the, the xylem and being passed on to the rest of the plant. So the Casparian strip is a last means of making sure that water goes and is checked appropriately by cells before it's allowed to transport on up the roof. Okay. Do please remember that roots need lots of surface area. We have root hairs for that. We also have that mycorrhizae, the mutualistic symbiotic relationship between plant roots and fungi. The roots are getting more surface area. The fungi are getting food from the plant. Everybody benefits. Okay. And this is what mycorrhizae look like. Uh, we've talked about those before. Please don't forget them. Um, all right, so we've already talked about the apoplast is when the substances travel along the cell walls. The symplast is when they actually pass through cells. This ultimately is what has to happen at some point so the water can get checked. Okay. Um, all right, so this is what I've already shown. Just different. Yeah, we're good. We're good. I've already seen that. Okay. Um, waxy. Yeah, we got it. All right. Um, now, transpiration then is the loss of water through leaves. Notice it says loss of water. Interestingly, if it weren't for losing water from the leaves, 
we would never get water into the plant. So though water loss sounds bad, it actually is a useful thing for the plant as well. It moves water pretty quick. Water can move up a tree at a rate of about 15 meters per hour. So it's rising up the tree really quickly uh, against the force of gravity. Okay, Average maple tree loses more than 200 liters of water per hour during a summer day. Um, that's a staggering amount of water being released from all of the plants that surround us. Okay, um, So the journey begins of this water at the root with it entering a root hair just as we saw. Okay, um, As roots are taking in water, they are also actively pumping in minerals. So here is my, here's a root cell. Okay, The cell is going to be actively pumping in minerals from the soil to the inner part of the cell. Why? Because if we lower this, uh, if we rather increase the solute concentration, so my solute concentration is getting high, then relatively speaking my water concentration is getting low, which means water will flow in by osmosis. So some active pumping here active pumping of minerals in is going to cause water to flow on its own by osmosis. Okay? So water flows by osmosis into the root cells because we're going to actively pump in minerals. Okay? Now, if I'm filling the cell up with water, it's like a water balloon. It's filling up, it's filling up. This is an example of positive pressure. Okay, which will cause, if this is my, uh, I'm going to draw a new cell here, I'm going to push water up the plant root, right? If I've got positive pressure, I'm pushing, I'm pushing, I'm taking in more water, and that's true. But this is not going to count for getting water all the way up into the tallest stems of a tree, okay? It's just not gonna gonna cut it. We're gonna get water up into the root just the tiniest little bit using root pressure, but it gets us started, okay? Indeed, in tiny, tiny plants near the ground, like this little plant here, we can see the effects of root pressure. And you see this in the form of uh, gutation, um, where essentially, if you look and this is not dew, though you might see it at the same time of day that you would see dew, which is just condensation from the atmosphere. That's not this. What has happened here is overnight, root pressure has forced water droplets out of the ends of the vascular tissue. And so you are seeing the effects of root pressure pushing water actually out of a plant. In a tree, this can't go that high, okay? That pressure will not help uh, to get water out the leaves of a tree, but we can see this effect in very small plants. Now, capillary action is a, a second step in getting water up that plant. If you will remember, when we talked about water, we said it was adhesive and cohesive. Cohesive means it likes to stick to itself. Adhesive means it likes to stick to other things as long as the other things are also polar. Okay? Well, here's the good news. The vascular tissue, the xylem vessels, if you'll remember we called the cells that make those up the tracheids and the vessel elements, they are polar, which means water will like them. Water likes those polar vessel uh, elements and tracheids, those tissues. Okay, um, and additionally, these tubes are extremely narrow. So, when water meets the vascular tissue that the water is attracted to because it's polar, it will begin to rise up much as if you hold a paper towel over a puddle that you have spilled of your drink. The liquid will come rising up the paper towel. This is the same way because the the tubes are so narrow and the polarity is so strong 
um, it can defy gravity and rise up into the paper towel or into the vascular tissue. Okay. Um, now, uh, this again only carries the water so far. It kind of keeps it from falling back down with the pull of gravity. Okay. Very slight pull is caused by capillary action, a very slight negative pressure up the xylem, but this is too is not enough to account for transpiration. It will hold the water up into the plant, but it's not going to pull it all the way. Okay. Now we are going to talk about true bulk flow, where we have to once again think in terms of water potential. Now plant leaves, I don't know if you'll remember this or not, but a leaf of a plant is a broad surface area. Here is my leaf, and if this is the top of the leaf on the plant, it's going to be covered with wax, or what is called a cuticle, and that is to prevent water loss. We're just going to cover the thing in wax so we aren't going to lose any water. Trouble is, if we can't let anything out, we can't get anything in, and we're not going to be able to breathe through this pardon, through the surface of the plant either. So, on the underside of the leaf, if we turned this leaf over and looked at the underside, we would, and had a really good mic microscope, we would see little tiny holes, okay? Uh, these are called stomata, and these are the holes that allow CO2 in, but sadly, they also allow water out which means if you're in a drought situation you could lose water, okay? But let's just assume it's a normal situation. The air out here, generally speaking, has less water in it than a tissue of a living thing. There's lots of water in you, there's lots of water in a plant, so air is going to generally have less. This means that water is going to go out with its concentration gradient, okay? Um, the water potential in the leaf is high, the water potential of the air is low. There is less water out here than there is in here. The water will tend to flow out through the stomata. Okay? All right. And so, water is always going to move from areas of high water potential to low water potential, and in this case, out of the leaf, and thus we would say the water is going to evaporate out of the leaf. Okay? But, Remember that water likes to stick to itself. It is cohesive, okay? Um, and so, if we have a tree, and here is a leaf, and water leaves, Remember, these tubes are all connected. These xylem and phloem tubes, are, or xylem tubes, are connected from here all the way down to the root of this plant. Okay? This means that if a water molecule is in here, it is holding hands with one next to it, which is holding hands with one next to it, um, which is holding hands with one next to it, because remember they're cohesive, they stick together. So if this water molecule leaves, it's going to pull the next one up behind it and so on. Because water is cohesive, when water molecules leave the leaf, they pull their friends up behind them. And so there's this conveyor belt of water molecules coming up from the soil and out through the leaves. Um, and so, in fact, it is this w loss of water that allows water to be pulled into the plant and up into the plant's body at all. So if the plant weren't losing water, it wouldn't be taking water in. It's kind of a, kind of a juxtaposition that's kind of hard to grasp, but that's the way it works. So negative pressure is created. This pulling motion as water leaves, it pulls more water up behind it. Okay, and it's transmitted all the way down to the soil. Okay, um, so, uh, and we've already said this, Inter interestingly, it's the transpiration or loss of water that actually allows the water to continue to move up the plant. Now, how do we control it? How do we keep from losing too much? Suppose we are having a drought and we don't want to lose so much water. We can't just let the stomata stay open and just let water flow out if there's no rainfall that's replacing the water out of the soil that we're, we're, we're pulling out. So, 
uh, these stomata, okay, these holes in the leaf, are surrounded by guard cells. So um, let me see if I've got a good picture I can show you. Here you go. If we're looking at the bottom of a leaf, this is the stomata, the hole. These on this side is one. This whole cell here is one guard cell. Okay, and this is another over here. This thing, it looks like a donut. Now, if this is falling apart today. All right. If conditions are good, then the stomata can be open. If there's no drought, we let in CO2 and water comes out along with oxygen, which was also nice because we breathe the oxygen. Um, but if conditions are poor, if drought, for example, is a threat um, or whatever, these stomata can actually close up and keep water loss to a minimum. Okay, here we can see an electromicrograph of the stomata on the bottom epidermis layer of a leaf. Um, so, um, let's suppose we have a drought condition. Okay, so we're going to close up these holes like that. Well, that's fine. No water can leave. That's good. It's a drought. We don't want water to leave in a drought situation. That could really be bad for us. But that also means that CO2 is not going to get in. And that means there shall be no photosynthesis. And that's bad. It is really bad not to have photosynthesis happening. Um, why? Because the plant can't make food and it will starve and it will die. So this is a problem. Um, we've got to be able to control some opening and closing of stomata. We, we don't want to leave them in one position too long. So how to balance this need uh, for CO2 with water loss issues? Uh, we have to control the stomata. The guard cells will change their shape. If there is plenty of water in the environment, the guard cells will become full of water. They will be turgid and it causes them to go through a shape change where they pop open and that hole is made bigger. Okay. Uh, when they lose water, perhaps we're in a drought situation, the cells, the guard cells become flaccid and collapse and sag down and that causes them to close the stomata and so we can control water loss. Changes in turgor pressure of the guard cells, meaning whether they are turgid and pop open or flaccid and sag down, are caused and controlled by an uptake or a loss of potassium ions in those guard cells themselves. Remember what we talked about so much with especially the kidney? Water follows the solutes. With the nephron, water follows the solutes. If we can control where the solutes are, we can control where the water is. Okay? So, this is an open stomata. This is a closed one with the guard cells on either side. Okay? When a plant needs CO2, it's just got to do some photosynthesis. These guard cells will have pumps in their membranes that will actively pump potassium ions in from neighboring epidermal cells. There's membrane pumps in their cell membranes. And because, let me show you a picture, because we are going to increase these red particles here indicate potassium, when we increase potassium by controlling that, putting it inside the guard cell, water will follow. Why? Because my solute concentration is high, that means my water concentration is low, water will flow in from high out here to low in there. Okay, well what if I now, uh, I want to open my guard cell, let in CO2, what if I want to close it because I'm losing too much water? Then my guard cells are actively going to pump calcium, I'm sorry, potassium out and we are going to then, water will follow those solutes out from an area of high water concentration to relatively low water concentration. Um, so we control the movement of water by controlling the movement of solutes over and over again. Animals, plants, same deal. Okay. Um, 
we will talk about C3 and CAM plants when we talk about photosynthesis um, and some of the cues that work with them. So I'm, uh, we are now up, up to transporting food in a plant, so I'm going to stop there. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you at the next one. Uh, take care.